Morning. Uh, it is 9.30, and so for the sake of promptness and the amount of material we have to cover, I am going to kind of ease into this. Uh, I know people are going to trickle in as they are able, and I will continue to admit people um, from the waiting room. So thank you for being patient with that process, and thank you again for being timely. Uh, I am hoping that uh, what you are able to see are uh, our climate adaptation webinar wheel uh, and a big presentation screen that says First Foods Policy Program, Second Wednesday, 2023 Outreach. Um, yep, thank you, Althea. Uh, I appreciate the feedback. Um, you know, it's been really a steep learning curve figuring out all of this technology and like what exactly displays properly and what doesn't and so I appreciate everybody being patient and being kind uh, and showing up on time. So just admitting people, I'm going to mute people as they come in just for the sake of a clean recording, but we will be able to talk with one another more freely as we get to those places in the presentation. But for now, I'm going to ask that we close our videos and make sure that we, you know, are on mute unless we are intentionally saying something. Uh, and I'm really grateful to you all for being here. Thank you so much for your engagement with this process and for um, caring about the work that we're doing here with climate adaptation. Uh, and so we have given it a little bit of time for people. I think they'll continue to trickle in, but I'm going to move forward in my presentation. Uh, and so welcome. Thank you again for being here. Uh, we have a few housekeeping items before we go forward. Uh, and I am going to also turn my camera off in solidarity with you all uh, so that um, we focus truly on the material being presented before us. Uh, we have, again, an opportunity to chat with one another uh, throughout the presentation, and there'll be places for us to do that. And so for now, I'm going to mute people uh, while they're here. But I just wanted to throw in uh, right ahead of time that star six, if you are on the phone, I don't think we have anybody on the phone right now, um, but the asterisk six is how you mute and unmute yourself if you are tuning in on the phone. Uh, the chat is always available for sharing your thoughts and answering questions. I do have a couple polls, so I'm gonna hope that those go well and uh, you're gonna be my guinea pigs on figuring that process out, so yay you. Um, but there is always uh, an electronic raise hand. Um, this is not a dictatorship. And so if you want to say something in the moment uh, during this presentation, you are more than welcome to raise your hand. And I will do my best to spot it uh, and give you the floor uh, when I am able and when I see that. So um, thank you again for working with the parameters that we have with this electronic engagement. Um, I do recommend the closed captions are available on Teams for anybody that might utilize them. I am definitely that meme of Velma looking for her glasses saying, my subtitles, my subtitles, I can't see without my subtitles. So they are available if you are also one of those people. Uh, and so I'm going to conduct a poll right now. And so this will be the very first poll that I've ever tried to do on this program. So let's see how it goes. And it's just to kind of warm us up and get us introduced and make sure all the technology is working all right. So got my question here. Launch now. So I'm hoping there will be a poll here in front of you pretty soon. So the question is, what are you most looking forward to this spring? So we have a selection, warmer weather, brr. Flowers blooming, birds return, bees are buzzing, the start of spring sports and outdoor activities, harvesting spring first foods and celery feast, the return of the spring salmon, the beginning of gardening and planting season, or I'm not excited for spring, I love the winter. Uh, or if you don't see your answer, you are welcome to write something in the chat. I'm gonna give it a few seconds for folks. Uh, and if you are not able to engage with it, please, let me know. You're not seeing the poll. Thank you, Kate. Let me figure out what's going on. Oh, I've got a few responses going. So, wonder 
What's going on? Does anyone else not see the poll? Please. Okay, so it sounds like enough people are seeing the poll. Uh, I'm going to give it just a couple more minutes or seconds rather than minutes. And thank you all for working with me with the technology. All right, I'm not sure how to close it now. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna close the poll. I think that's the button for it. Nope, that's not what it is. Ah, there we go. Okay, thank you everybody. So it looks like, let's see if I can share out support results. Nope, that's not the one. Uh, so it looks like 11, it looks like 9% of people are looking forward to warm weather. Most people are looking forward to flowers and bees, 18% of you, 27% are looking forward to outdoor activities, 9% looking forward to celery feasts, 18% looking forward to the return of salmon, uh, and 18% looking forward to the beginning of gardening. No winter lovers here, which is fine with me. So thank you. That was great. Uh, and if we keep going like that, then this will be a great webinar. So what we're here today to do a lot of is to introduce the Climate Adaptation Plan. And so this is an opportunity for us to share in uh, not great detail about what's in the plan. We are going to spend the rest of this year looking at the materials in the plan more in depth. But for right now, we're going to just do a really quick overview. Uh, and so I am going to play a video that I took earlier this week so that I wasn't going to have to be doing all of the talking. So let's see how that works out. So uh, I am hoping that you can see a still image of me and let's I need the perfect. Thank you, Lauren. So we're going to see how this goes. And if you do not hear anything, please let me know. Uh, but otherwise, if it goes OK, let's just let it ride. Thanks again for being here. All right, so let's get into it. What is in the climate adaptation plan? Uh, and so in the monthly presentations that we'll do for the rest of this year, we're going to get more in depth with the certain sections that are in this. And so for right now, I'm just going to give you a really quick overview of what's in the executive summary so that you know what's going to be coming and where you might go to look for more information about the specific things that you are interested in. And so come along with me for a ride. I'm going to first and foremost show you where you can find all of the wonderful documents that we have. And so right now, I'm hoping that you can see the CTUIR homepage. Uh, we're going to go to this top tab that says government and down to departments. And from here, we will navigate down the page to find our Department of Natural Resources. And on our Department of Natural Resources page, over to the left, you will find climate adaptation towards the bottom. And so here is our dedicated climate adaptation website where you can find climate projections that have been done for our area. You can find the archived recordings of the webinar that we did in 2021. And here we have our finalized climate adaptation plan. And so if you scroll down, you can see that there are three options for you. We have um, the full plan is available in a lower resolution, which is going to um, be a little bit easier to download. Uh, there are a lot of photos and a lot of maps in here, and so it is a rather large document. Um, and so the high resolution, if you're looking for a map that has specific information that you're looking for, you might want to try the high resolution version because it's going to be a better grain on those maps that you're looking for. But for today, we're gonna to go through this executive summary. And I will try not to scroll too quickly to give anybody motion sickness, but I do wanna stay within our time limit. 
And so the executive summary is offered separately from the full document. It didn't make a lot of sense to add the 40 pages of the executive summary then on top of what was already a very long plan. And so we separated them out into um, two different offerings. Um, and in this executive plan or executive summary, you can see that chapters one and two are largely omitted. Um, chapter one is a lot of the background material of the Cayuse, Umatilla, and Walla Walla people and the confederated governance that um, is operating now. Uh, and chapter two is more of that overarching climate science uh, for the Pacific Northwest. It does have some information about ocean acidification, which is something that CTUIR does really care about, even though um, we are not a coastal tribe. Uh, our salmon and our lamprey migrate out to the ocean to become nourished, uh, and then they migrate back, bringing that, those resources and those nutrients back with them. And so in that way, we do care about ocean acidification and are keeping an eye on it. And so those are what's, what's in chapter one and two um, that's missing from the executive summary. Um, but the bulk of the information is in chapter three, Shapa Tunwit, the impacts and adaptation goals. Uh, and so within this, our areas of focus are broken up with uh, water, our surface and groundwaters, our first foods availability and access, our infrastructure and built systems, human health and happiness, energy production and use, economics and community, and then tribal sovereignty and treaty rights. And I wanted to just say thank you again to everyone who made our webinar series a success. It was amazing to see the knowledge that is contained within this community. Um, thank you for sharing with us. Uh, it is important to note that the Climate Adaptation Plan does not create a separate vision or mission. Some plans do, but this one does not. Um, we felt that the comprehensive plan, the vision that was put forward in 2010 by the CTIR community was a great one to continue to work with. And so really what the uh, climate adaptation plan does is take that comprehensive planned vision out into an uncertain future. And so how to use this plan. Um, when we talk about planning, a lot of the information that we use to make decisions is historical information, because obviously the future hasn't happened yet and we can't really look in forward and say, oh, that's going to happen, so let's do this. Um, but the problem with using historical data is that the future doesn't look like the past. And so if we are using historical data, we are planning for a future that doesn't exist. And so this, this climate adaptation plan is an opportunity to offer an alternative to our planning processes and say, this is what we think will happen. How does this affect now what we're planning to do? Uh, and especially for things like infrastructure that have such a long timeline, it really is important to make sure that we are planning for a more accurate future than historical data provides. Um, the climate adaptation plan is also an opportunity to look more granularly at some of the projections offered by downs, um, downscale climate modeling. Um, we've had a number of uh, modeling efforts done for our area, and they give a really rough overview of things that are gonna happen, like, oh, days over 90 degrees will increase you know, to this number. Um, but that really doesn't tell us much about what that looks like on the ground for the work that we are doing and for the lives that we lead. Uh, and so this climate adaptation plan is an attempt to look at that on the ground information of what do these changes actually look like for our lives specifically. And a lot of the estimates that we need to make decisions are ones that we don't have directly. And so there are many proxy estimates in this plan that are used in lieu of the very specific data that we will need to generate. Um, one of the best examples of this is the first foods because they're not directly agricultural products or commercial products. There isn't a lot of attention paid to them in terms of data collection and modeling. And so some of the information that we are having to go on is information from an agricultural sector that is doing this modeling for their, their products. Um, but this is also helping us identify where there are gaps in information that we will need to fill in uh, as we go forward. And so this has been an exercise in then seeing what information is and isn't there as well. The goals of the climate plan are really simple. One, center indigenous knowledge and environmental justice in the climate crisis planning. Um, 
we cannot keep making the same mistakes that have brought us to this point. And so when we look at adapting, we need to make sure that the people who have done the least to create this problem and have been adapting since time immemorial are the ones at the forefront, which is tribal people. Um, goal number two is the recognition that we cannot do this alone. Um, we have to work together and create interdisciplinary strategies to address short-term variability from year to year and then long-term climatic changes. And then the third goal is to really celebrate the work that this tribe has done, not only since time immemorial, but in you know, recent decades and recent years, uh, this tribe and this community has been adapting, this tribe and this community is resilient. Uh, and so this is an opportunity to really put that into paper to become policy so that as you know, states and nations recognize climate adaptation work that's being done, this tribe is recognized as having always done this work. Uh, I'm sure the adaptation wheel is not new to a lot of you, but this is the kind of map that guides some of the work that we do. A lot of this can become really overwhelming uh, and it can be easy to get lost in all of the information that uh, is coming out about climate modeling and the climate impacts that we're seeing. And so this adaptation wheel is a visual recognition that we are all connected. The work that we do is connected and it provides a little bit of that Adriadne's thread through the labyrinth of climate modeling. Uh, and so it's really, it highlights the way that this, this plan is organized. And so again, we're gonna go through these in detail throughout this year. And so I'm not gonna dwell too much on each of these, um, but we'll start with water, the first of the first foods and the, the most important of everything. Uh, and so impacts to surface water, so the water flowing along the surface will be things like changes in hydrology, um, you know, impacts to the snowpack that we are able to uh, accumulate throughout the year, uh, as well as the droughts and the lower summer base flows that we expect to see. Groundwater was something that we really, really wanted to highlight uh, as pulling out separate from um, surface water. They're really interconnected. So groundwater really um, informs surface water and surface water really impacts groundwater. Um, but so much of the industries and the households on the Umatilla Indian Reservation are groundwater fed. Uh, and so knowing the changes to this particularly um, difficult to see resource is going to be really important. And so we see changes in storage capacity or storage potential, as well as a potential for contamination uh, are something that we're looking at in this section. And then adaptations, um, conservation of water, number one, how are we you know, making sure that we have good clean water in our rivers? Um, Floodplain reconnection is another thing that we really focus on for our surface waters. And then data collection, working with partners on cross-jurisdictional monitoring of waters, and then the management of water is something that we really highlight here in these adaptations. For first foods, we have first foods availability. So that's the health and the abundance of the first foods themselves out on the land. Um, warming waters, we have already, we know are an impact for salmon and other aquatic species. We know that plants are changing their migration patterns, their timing out on the lands. Uh, and we know that they have really important connections with insects like pollinators. And so how are these relationships changing as a result of um, increasing carbon dioxide? Uh, and then how are other species migrating? So our invasive and displaced species pressures, how are these being affected by increasing carbon? We also see uh, topsoil and riparian erosion as the water is moving faster, it's more likely to take our important soil uh, to a place that we are not able to utilize it. Um, and then that soil is also not supporting the plants that um, keep bigger species like deer and elk uh, sustained. And um, we see calf nutrition being something that really is going to be impacted, uh, as well as the changing potential for plant and animal pathogens. So those are things like ticks and bacteria and mold. Um, these are things that will thrive under warming conditions. And so how do we get ahead of that? First foods access are the ways that tribal members are able to 
gets to harvest opportunities. And so we see impacts like flooding and storms um, take out bridges and roads that are essential to access certain points of the forest or harvest opportunities. Uh, wildfire risk puts everyone at risk or it, you know, threatens public safety as well as access points. Uh, and then poor air quality, you know, access issues can be intangible like heat and smoke. And so looking at what do we do when the air or the temperature is hazardous for us to be out uh, exercising our treaty rights. And so these adaptations really look at, again, that getting information, where are information gaps and where can we be doing better uh, for knowing what's happening. Um, also proactively managing wildfire risk by doing fuels treatment uh, and then understanding our harvest op opportunities and practices and how first foods either respond or negatively or positively to these uh, and how do we use that information to inform how we go about harvest uh, now and into the future. Physical infrastructure are like our roads, our bridges, and our buildings. These are all things that we put a lot of money into, and so we would like them to continue to persist. Uh, increasing severity and frequency of storms, not only flooding and wind events, but also things like heat uh, will really stress our buildings and our built infrastructure. Um, Transportation infrastructure is the one that first comes to mind, I think, for a lot of people, especially forest service roads that are used to access harvest opportunities. And so knowing how these um, points of access are going to be impacted is really important. Uh, indoor air filtration is already starting to become, you know, really impacted as we see smoky summers as just one of many air quality pollution pollutants, um, our HVAC systems are really going to struggle to keep up with all of that. Uh, and then development in the wildland urban interface, while not specifically a climate impact, knowing how our footprint out on the land, whether we're encroaching into the forest or down to the river, um, restricts our ability to manage those natural systems in a changing climate. Built systems are our communication networks, our transportation networks. Uh, and so looking at our impacts to how we communicate, how our kayak public transit service might be impacted by climate change will give us a fuller picture, uh, as well as the increased potential for water and airborne pathogens as a result of our built infrastructure, things like our water pipes um, is something that I think a lot of people don't necessarily think about when they think about climate impacts, but is something to keep an eye on. Uh, and then it's not all bad news. We also see opportunities to mitigate um, carbon release through materials management. And so um, recycling and composting are two things that we see really highlighted here as opportunities for this. And so the adaptations are, again, knowing, just trying to know more of getting people involved in um, information and reporting of developing communities that are walkable or <clears throat> you know transportable over non-carbonized sources and so walking biking horses um, building communities where everything is right there so that you're not having to use carbon burn carbon to live your day-to-day -day life uh, and then there's always opportunities to divert materials from landfills to um, prevent carbon from methane and other other de decomposition uh, emissions. And so physical health, this um, health is both physical and emotional, right? And so complications from extreme heat uh, will be something that our area will really need to grapple with, especially people who find themselves outside uh, for a large part of their year. Um, that also goes true for wildfire smoke. Um, you know, smoke is actually something that really over a long period of time, chronic exposure causes a lot of problems. And so how do we prepare people for those chronic exposure conditions? Contamination of water um, from harmful algal blooms uh, on the lands are something that we need to get more of a handle on. We've seen that happen in the Richland area the last couple of years. And so knowing more about how our algal blooms are going to affect ability to exercise treaty rights in those areas is important. 
Uh, allergy season is something that a lot of people have talked about when we're doing outreach. And so unfortunately, allergies will become more potent uh, as we go forward into a warming climate. And then ozone is something that I think is really unique for us in the Pacific Northwest region because of industries located along the Columbia River. We're actually more likely to see impacts from ozone for our tribal fishermen more specifically um, than for the rest of the Pacific Northwest. Emotional well-being, so um, connection to first foods and spiritual connection to culture. Um, as species migrate and as things become more challenging, uh, there is a potential for a disconnection from indigenous culture. Uh, and so making sure that we're really getting ahead of that and making sure that people have those connections and those opportunities to learn is really essential. Uh, and then making sure that we are aware that indigenous communities the connection to the land and to you know the community itself is so much more important than for non-indigenous communities and so making sure that we're really highlighting the fact that displacement has a disproportionate burden on indigenous people um, so shelter in place orders are not always the answer displacement um, needs to really be addressed practically this is a place where we examine those impacts and so adaptations are a lot of just coming together uh, of opportunities like this and the ones that we'll have later this year of coming together and sharing our experiences and our stories with one another is really a huge component of um, being healthy and happy in a climate future. Uh, energy is um, generated and used. And so we look at the energy generation and transmission here. Um, the way that energy is generated is likely to change because of um, changing climate conditions. But then we also need to keep our eye on transmission because that is really where there's a potential for a lot of things to go wrong, uh, especially as we energy facilities are looking to pass increasing costs off to customers. And then we know that um, as summers get warmer, we here are already fairly prepared for extreme heat, but our west side, like the Portland area, really is still um, coming to terms with that. And so we will see this dramatic increase demand for summer cooling as this life-saving strategy, um, which is also likely to cause energy prices to increase for everyone. But the good news is there is an opportunity for energy efficiency to reduce our demand on the energy grid uh, and for us to be able to be more insulated from some of these climate effects. And so the adaptations that are offered here for energy are a lot of what we're already doing, which is look at um, renewable energy potential where it's appropriate of making sure tribal families and entrepreneurs have uh, information, technical assistance and financial assistance to implement energy projects that they want to implement and to make sure that we are all moving forward together. Uh, so economics and community, this is really how people interact with each other. And so looking at economic developments, disasters are very expensive. And so when we talk about increasing disasters, we are looking at the fact that, you know, governments are having to respond to flooding events and families are having to fork out money for displacement for a period of time. And so this all has a dollar value. And so trying to look at how is responding to natural disasters going to increase financial burdens on families and governments. Um, tourism is a big part of our, our economy. And so we don't really have a good idea of how a lot of these disasters are going to impact the way people travel and spend money. Uh, and then disruption of supply chains is something that we really, the last couple of years have seen come full force. Uh, that when things happen around the globe, we are impacted because we are buying from global businesses. And this is unfortunately likely to continue into the future. We will also see uh, municipalities and nations uh, grapple with the cost of climate change. Um, more than half of the 
counties in the United States are going to be spending money, more money responding to climate emergencies than they are taking in in annual revenue. And so that's not a good math equation to find yourself in. And so unfortunately we are in one of those areas. And so how do we get ahead of this hemorrhaging of money responding to climate crisis impacts before they arrive? But there's also opportunities for carbon sequestration through vegetation and soil management. Uh, and so if you're looking for farming and forestry impacts, this is gonna be right here in this um, economics, economic development component. Um, There's a lot that looks at how do we sequester carbon, not only for the benefit of pulling it out of the air, but for the benefit of the soil and the plants that we are managing as well. Community support, how do we continue to connect with one another? And so with shelter in place orders that come with like heat and smoke, um, that makes isolation a very real danger, especially for people who have mobility challenges or for elders who really don't have uh, a lot to do other than be outside. Uh, and so how do we make sure that people are not being left behind, left in isolation when we are responding to these disasters? And this goes too for the emotional and mental strain. Um, it can be a lot to deal with some of these things, especially if they're coming one after another. Uh, and so building resilience within ourselves and our communities is really important. Population migration is another thing that we really don't have a lot of good information about yet. Uh, and so this is a opportunity for us to learn more about our neighbors and how migration might uh, affect our area. Uh, and then changes in food security and food safety. Um, we've already seen that things, as things change, the way that we can supply food safely to our community is going to change as well. So adaptations for this section are all about getting people the tools that they need. It's a lot of supporting small businesses. It's a lot of teaching people food safe practices. It's a lot of making sure that people have the ability to get food assistance if they find themselves in need. Um, and then as well as bringing the land back to the tribe. So developing a land acquisition plan and different ways of implementing land back is a part of this section. And then the last one, uh, tribal sovereignty and treaty rights. This, um, how does the government continue to manage itself and its community uh, in a self-determining way into the future? We know that resources are likely to become strained. And so making sure that we're proactively managing conflict is going to be a big part of this. Conflict not over not only just over resources, but also with our, our communities as well, as we see increasing extreme heat cause people to behave in stranger ways. Um, and then we also know that the collective continuance, the promise of the first foods uh, is something that will be strained by climate change, but we can get ahead of that. And knowing that, what do we do to manage for that strain? Uh, and then there really is an opportunity for tribes, especially federally recognized tribes to be leaders in this work. Um, not only have tribes been adapting to changes in climate since time immemorial, but federally recognized tribes have a really interesting suite of mechanisms at their disposal to force action that other uh, stakeholders don't have. Uh, and so really we see an opportunity for tribes to be at the forefront of this work. For treaty rights, it's a little bit of um, a repeat of what we've already said. Uh, there is really an opportunity to redu reduce risk through cultural practices through making sure people are continuing to do what they have done for centuries, uh, especially with cultural burning here on the west side, we really see a benefit to bringing that practice back. Uh, and then making sure that people are out on the lands safely, especially when there are heat and smoke conditions, as well as a bunch of other challenges to safety during um, treaty rights exercise. And so adaptation goals for this are really work with our partners. Uh, again, we cannot do this work alone. A lot of um, the first foods are found off of the res. And so we need to be working with partners who have the tribe's interests in heart because um, what's good for the tribe is good for the region as uh, Antone Minthorin always says. 
Uh, and so um, working with our partners and pulling at those mechanisms, the legal and legislative mechanisms that this tribe has specifically, as well as working with education and communication. Um, I'm really glad that our language program had the participation that they did with our webinar series because like keeping the language alive is like a huge part of keeping the culture alive. Uh, and so making sure that we really are protecting that is a huge part of climate adaptation. And so uh, I think that that might be where I will cut it for now. Um, Woo, that was a lot. Thank you all for bearing with me. So we're going to break things up a little bit by doing another poll. And so we'll give this a few minutes. So if you need to step away and stretch yourself, um, this poll is going to be a little bit different because it will ask you to reorder some of the priorities. And so it's going to give you a list of things. Let me pull it up here. Again, thank you for bearing with me. We are all learning to work with this wonderful technology that we have at our disposal. So let's see, question two, there it is. So this question is going to ask you kind of to rank the priorities of the things that were just shared with you. So I'm launching the poll now and we'll take a couple minutes uh, to go through that. Um, but in the meantime, if folks want to share anything right now, I know that we heard a lot. Uh, and so if there are thoughts that come to folks' minds, we have a few minutes where people can share if they want. And again, I'd ask maybe raise your hand or just unmute yourself and go ahead and jump in. And if you're on the phone, star six is how you mute and unmute yourself. So the poll in front of you, I'm hoping that people are able to kind of figure it out. The polls on Teams are not as friendly as I feel like the ones on Zoom are, but we work with what we've got. Uh, and so we have kind of a selection of things, water management, first foods, habitat, safe and efficient homes and facilities, health impacts from chronic hazards, energy reliability and diversified generation, building first foods centered economy, strengthening community capacity, um, tribal self-determination through services and opportunities to exercise treaty rights. Um, this is again an opportunity for us to kind of move things up or down based on how important they are to us in our daily life. And I know that we are talking about this as it's interconnected. And so the idea of ranking these different things is very counterintuitive, but we also do have finite energy, time and resources to address these things. And so just trying to figure out where we're starting is going to be a large part of our climate implementation survey. So again, if anybody wants to say anything right now, there's a few minutes for us to do that while everybody kind of gets a handle of this poll and then we'll move on. Thank you for all your hard work, Colleen. Um, I'm excited to learn more. Thank you for your hard work, Darcy. It's been really wonderful seeing you um, work with the, your uh, vermicomposting and then with the work that you're doing with the nursery and the Amazon grant that you received. It's been amazing to see this community really take that on. Thank you for being part of that work. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. This poll was a little bit much. Do, do people still need more time? Are you still um, wanting to figure this one out? We also will have opportunities offline to be doing some of this ranking and prioritization. And again, this is the first of many of these kinds of opportunities. And so there will be more than enough opportunity for everyone to share their voices and their perspectives. So I'll give it about 30 more seconds unless I hear someone say, no, 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 stop. Uh, and then we'll move on in our presentation. Thank you again for being here.
I think that I can leave the poll open. And so if you do still want to keep working on it. Oh, Antone, are you wanting to share? I know that I see you. We cannot hear you. We still aren't able to hear you. Um, it doesn't look, it looks like you're muted. So while oh, you look like you're off muted, Antone, but we still don't hear anything. Mm, still nothing. Um, it might be that there's a connection issue. And so um, I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to share with us. I think that we're going to talk a little bit about. Yeah, I don't I don't know what's going on either. Well, um, I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to share. And when you do get it working, please just uh, speak up. It would be wonderful to have someone um, work with us to be able to troubleshoot some of this. Uh, a lot of us are doing this kind of just on the fly. And so it uh, has been quite the learning curve. So we're this year, 2023 is going to be uh, implementation survey. So we were able to persist through the pandemic this past year or past couple years to get our, our community outreach done with this plan, but it was not done in a standard kind of way. And so we're looking forward to going back to talk with you all in a more concerted way about the things that are written in the plan. So again, we have very finite amount of time and energy to do this work. And so the dreaded idea of prioritization is no one's favorite thing, but uh, we will need to figure out where to start. And so that's what we're going to be doing this year is talking with you all to figure out where things need to start right now, like yesterday, uh, and which things can maybe be put until we have a little bit more energy and capacity to address these issues. Uh, and so there is a survey monkey poll that we have out as a drop. Oh, I hear you. We've got you, Antone. And we've lost you now. OK, well, it was progress. Um, please keep trying, and we're looking forward to hearing from you. Uh, and so there's a survey monkey poll that we're going to have available. It's kind of a standing poll, but then we're also going to be doing polls during these second Wednesday outreach opportunities as well. Uh, and so we're going to try another one of these polls here because the first couple went so successfully. Uh, and so there should be a poll that's going to pop up here in a little bit that will ask you about your familiarity with the climate adaptation plan itself. So I am launching that poll. So hopefully people are able to see it. And so it goes through just that I'm extremely familiar. I was very engaged with the process. I'm, you know, kind of familiar, not so familiar, or didn't know at all that it was happening. Um, this is helping us get to know where we can be better. 
uh, and inform some of the outreach that we'll be doing this coming year. So are people able to see the poll? You don't see a poll. Thank you, Karen. Let's see. I was playing around with these yesterday, so this is all rather new at this time. So let's see if we can't get that to launch again. Thank you again for bearing with me. All right, maybe it's not wanting to go. So again, I'm going to see if people can see a poll. Sorry again for the repeat questions. Nope, doesn't look like it's going. Well, we got at least one poll done, so we know that we have the capability and we look forward to doing a little bit more of this polling uh, successfully in our subsequent meetings, but for now we're going to move on. And again, Anton, if you're able to get your sound up and running, we would still love to hear from you. Uh, so the outreach that we have planned for this year is going to be kind of centered around three things. Uh, we're talking with you about the climate adaptation plan and the implementation survey that we're going to be conducting. But then we've also been uh, invited to talk with the community a little bit more about the Umatilla Basin Water Rights Settlement and some of the recent uh, progress that's been made in that negotiation process. And so we're looking forward to sharing more with you about that in a lot of different ways, hybrid meetings and some tours and things. Um, but then we also here in our First Foods Policy Program have realized that people might not necessarily know what policy does for them on like a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and so we're excited to launch our policy and action series of workshops and youth activities so that we can talk more with people about the way that the policies that this government creates do affect their lives and do affect the way that the tribe is able to create that self-determination. And so we anticipate having a bunch of different formats and venues. Um, you know, today is a, a midday weekday event, and I apologize for that. I know that that's very prohibitive for folks to attend, uh, but we are doing the recording, so at least people will be able to kind of uh, have a sense of participation with this one, and then we'll be changing it up. We're going to do some afternoon, evening, and hopefully some weekend events, uh, hybrid and in-person and virtual, just to make it as accessible for folks as possible. Um, and so different venues that we're looking at, we are hoping to really utilize the NGC, the Nikiawe Governance Center Rotunda. We did that for our uh, Department of Natural Resources open house and that worked out really, really well. Uh, and then probably snag a few of the conference rooms on the side for the policy and action workshops. And then, you know, we have some beautiful uh, locations that we would love to highlight. So the recent Birch Creek uh, golf course acquisition uh, is something that we would love to incorporate into some of our outreach. And then of course, working with the senior center has always been an amazing partnership uh, and working with outside partners too, to provide additional outreach opportunities. And so I think I'm probably gonna skip question five, but I would love if you have um, times that are better or worse for you, this is something that we're trying to get a sense of for people uh, to make sure that we're scheduling things as people are able to attend them. But I also get the sense that like everything is just so busy and so really there is no perfect time. And so just trying to offer a bunch of different options is going to be best. So really quickly, kind of just the baseline of things that we're excited for are our second Wednesday. So that's going to be a monthly reoccurrence. It won't always be at this time, uh, but we are hoping to really maintain that consistent second Wednesday. And so here is kind of the list of dates for those with the, our vague topic areas. Uh, you can see that we have earmarked September. Don't worry, Roundup and Happy Canyon families, we will not be asking you to... Uh, learn during that time. We know that you are busy. 
Uh, and so we ask you to look forward to our announcements. If you're on the email list, you're probably getting those already. And then we're going to put ads in the CUJ to highlight those uh, at least, uh, you know, a little bit in advance. And so, again, our policy in action the second Wednesday is one that we're excited to um, be offering. Just again, policy does so much, but it's so behind the scenes and it's kind of boring if you're not like really interested in it. Uh, and so we're going to have some workshops that highlight different uh, CTUIR plans and policies and how these really affect how the tribe governs itself and the activities and projects that are put forward. And so some examples of those, again, tentatively are our salmon policy and the way that that has informed water, water quality restoration. The tribe's TMDL, the total maximum daily load, uh, is a measure of water quality and how that is used to inform water management on the reservation. Uh, landscape management for pollinators, and then just what the heck is the 638 compact uh, and how can it provide some economic opportunity for this tribe. Uh, the Umatilla Basin Water Rights Settlement. Uh, again, we're going to share more information about this as we kind of have an outreach plan clarified. Uh, and so uh, we are going to have hybrid events, so in person, uh, as well as uh, plugged in virtually. And we're going to also conduct a survey with that one. And that's going to be mostly to support the idea that it's to generate data to support tribes treatment as state. That's its ability to set regulations based on data and enforce those regulations for the reservation. Uh, and so we're looking to generate a survey that provides information that can be in support of that treatment as state. Um, and also really to update the, the public and the community about the negotiation process. And we're hoping to have tours as part of that. So it won't be just be things like me sitting here talking at you. It will be getting out of the land and getting to see the river and some of the reservoirs and then some of the irrigation infrastructure that is down in the west, the lower Umatilla Basin. And so again, I'm going to skip this question just because the polls haven't been cooperating. Um, just one more thing couple more things before I open the floor for everybody. Um, there has been a lot of money earmarked in the bipartisan infrastructure bill for carbon removal. Uh, as far as we've seen things, they're not necessarily written to support natural landscapes. And so there has been a little bit of a gold rush on the idea of capturing carbon because of the funding available through those, those funding legislation. Uh, and so there are a number of opportunities for the West Coast to engage with this funding and for carbon removal opportunities. And so we're hoping to work with some outside partners to offer opportunities for us to learn more about those. I know that I am not familiar with a lot of the technology um, that is available. So Anton, I see that you're still trying to talk. Uh, it looks like you have control, so I don't know if that's going to make anything better, hopefully. It will. Um, but there are a lot of opportunities for uh, natural systems, ocean removal, and so opportunities to partner with uh, tribes on the coast. Uh, and so there are also projects that have occurred in the past here in the Columbia River Basin. The Wallula project is one that we're hoping to get more information for the tribe, tribal community to learn more about because it already happened back in 2013. And so we have this project that we're now kind of learning about retroactively. And so we'd love to learn more about those carbon removal technologies. And I see someone is not on the email list, but would love to be. So I will make sure that that happens. Thank you for letting me know. Anton, it looks like we still have not resolved the issue, but I am really grateful to you to continue trying. I wish that there was more that I could do to help on this end. Uh, yeah, Lauren says that you can call in. That's a very good idea. Thank you for that suggestion, Lauren. Uh, so opportunities for partner organizations. Um, basically, if you just like pull up the full climate adaptation document and do a search for your organization's name, uh, good, chances are good that if you work with the tribe already, uh, it's your name is going to be in there already very specifically spelled out. Uh, but there are also opportunities for your organization to go through some of the materials that we have produced and see where some of these things align with the work that you're already doing with the mission that you have. Um, you know, there's always opportunity to incorporate indigenous knowledge 
and environmental justice into your projects. Uh, and so this really is an opportunity to um, have a clear guidance on how to do that. So Anton, you are plugged back in and I hope that we are able to hear from you. Do you wanna give it a try? We still aren't hearing from you, unfortunately. All right, well, I have one more thing before I open up the floor. Uh, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to uh, share a little bit about something that's weighed heavy on me. And I would love to ask for this community to um, maybe sit in silence for a moment. Uh, the CTUIR has not made a stance on this incident. So the words that I share are from my perspective only. Uh, and I speak as a professional in the field of climate change, uh, that it's important to raise awareness about the dangers of advocates for nature. Um, on January 18th, Manuel Esteban Paez Teran, known as Tortuguita, was shot and killed by Georgia State Police while camping as part of a blockade aimed at preventing destruction of 85 acres of the South River urban forest in Southeast Atlanta to build a $90 million urban warfare style police academy. I'm not gonna go into this event, but I do invite you to learn more uh, through your preferred search engine. And I just wanted to highlight the fact that this, this killing happened in the same week that climate activist Greta Thunberg was arrested. And the photo of her grinning while police carried her away really jars with what happened to this young person. A uh, watchdog organization, Global Witness, recently reported that 1,700 climate activists around the world have been murdered in the last decade, and many of these are indigenous land defenders. And now this violence has come home to water our soil. When I think of the people in our community, people like Atwe, Art McConville, and my dear friend Willa Wallace, of all the people from our community who answered the call at Standing Rock, who stood in solidarity with that nation, and of the people who are still resisting, like Shelly Harjo and the Reno Sparks Indian community down on the Oregon-Nevada border at Thacker Pass, who are protecting their communities against mineral extraction. I think of what this means for the people who walk as water protectors in our community, who pays the price to challenge the fossil fuel centered status quo, and how do we protect what we love in order to survive? And so I'd love to ask for just a few moments of silence from everybody on the call. Thank you for participating. Um, and again, I'd like to remind everyone that the CTR has not made a stance on this incident. This is not um, perspective of the tribal government. Uh, again, as a professional in the field of climate change work, I appreciate the time and attention that I have to draw awareness about the dangers that advocates of nature face. You know, it's not all just grant proposals, but you know, some of this is dangerous work. So now we get to chat with each other. So I would love if you have the ability to turn your camera on and if you want to share things, um, please let's chat. Uh, Antone, I see that you're back on. You are unmuted. And so I'm really hoping that we get to hear what you have to say. Um, I think we'll put that call in number again, um, but then I, op I open the floor. And if no one speaks up, I am going to call on Althea. I have a question. Um, has composting been a discussion with the tribe? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I know that we have talked about it. So our turf, our tribal environmental recovery facility has um, wanted to do compost. And it, I get the sense that it is easy to do. There might be a little bit of infrastructure needed, like a concrete slab, uh, basically to kind of contain the composting as it cooks. 
Um, but really, it's just a matter of finding a champion in the community of somebody who can work with that. And I understand that you are really working hard at getting your own vermicomposting up and running. Um, it's something that we see funding being put out consistently for. Uh, and so it really just takes us coordinating with our recovery facility, our turf, to apply for those grants and make sure that we're not competing with one another. Um, I would love to see it go forward more. And obviously, I'm working, I'm trying to work with you to find opportunities to do so. And I'd love to hear more about the work that you're doing. Awesome. Good info. Um, I just want to compost, you know, uh, sequestering that methane is so important to me. As you too. Absolutely. And methane is so potent. So it um, methane is one of those compound carbons. We talk a lot about carbon dioxide, but methane is actually extremely potent. Um, and so it has uh, 24 to 84 times the potency of carbon dioxide. It's uh, 24 times initially after it's released, but then it gets even more powerful as it decay as, as time goes along. Uh, and so Really composting to me is, uh, I keep using the phrase low-hanging fruit just because I feel like that really is what it is. Uh, it's the ability to prevent that methane release by just not putting biological materials into landfills. You know, it feels like really a wonderful opportunity not only to prevent carbon release, uh, but also uh, improve quality of life, you know, and make sure that our resources are not just getting landfilled. If I was reading correctly, um, statistics say with composting, we could uh, um, um, save potentially millions of lives here on the Columbia River, or was I reading that wrong? I think that what you were reading was the effects of ozone from the landfills and the incinerator in Arlington. I think that this was the document that I had sent to you. Uh, and so that was kind of an aggregate. Here we have feedback. Give me a second to find it. Oh, I hear somebody talking. Oh, there you can talk to this one and come. We got you. Please share with us. It's on the phone. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I can hear myself. Really hear myself. <laughs> Is it causing an echo? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, maybe what to... you can do is mute your computer or um, turn the sound down on the computer. Did that help there? Okay. Did that work? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can. We'd love to hear from you. I take your headphones off. There, you can hear them on the, like, the telephone call. Okay. Yep, you're good Hello? to go. Okay. Well, where are you at? I mean, uh, in the discussion, I'm listening. Um, we were talking about carbon, but we would love to hear whatever you would love to share with us. I know that you've been trying to get on for a minute, and so we're waiting to hear your wisdom. Okay, all I, all I want to what what I want to say initially, after uh, watching uh, the presentation, uh, I think uh, I think that's. Uh, 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 really uh, an important overall strategic plan uh, that that uh, involves the Confederate tribes of Umatilla, uh, uh, Cayuse, Walla Walla, Umatilla, and and all their interests. Uh, relative to the Treaty of 1855 and and honoring the treaty rights that established the Umatillian Reservation, but also having the rights in the ceded area. And uh, that in the treaty, uh, we we lost our, our sovereignty and our self-government, but we got it back in 1935, Indian Reorganization Act, 
And from that point, when we elected our own people, our own own government, and not let the let the federal not let the federal government or Bureau of Indian Affairs manage manage us, then we begin we begin to come back. But but the over that time, uh, our uh, uh, land, our lands, our natural resources, our homeland uh, had had been really impacted, and we lost a lot of our a lot of our um, uh, uh, treaty rights and uh, and land. And uh, I think I think that the tribal government overall all the departments have to understand that they have to understand uh, that that uh, that they that the tribe has all those treaty rights uh, the natural resources the soil the water all those first food steps which first food stuff uh, and and we're in that process of restoring that and that's everybody it's all the departments uh, have that responsibility, and they got to know that, and staffs got to know that, and they got to they got to have a strategy uh, to accomplish that, to get those right, restore those rights back. And we did that. We we did that with the Human Television Project. We got water and salmon uh, fish back into the river. But the point of that is that 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 it was a win-win. Everybody in the Yuma Teller River Basin benefited from that. In the same way, when we when we did build our economy, uh, our wild horse, uh, it wasn't only the tribe that been, everybody benefited from that. Yeah, but but again, uh, to restore uh, our our treaty rights, particularly say like in grazing, uh, first foods. Uh, our staffs have to know that, understand that, and begin doing that. And what's impressive is that that they're they're on that on track already. Uh, and I just want to uh, mention that I I, I uh, uh, understand what's uh, pretty much what's going on. And and I just hope that all our all our uh, tribal members and all our staffs understand that what the treaty rights and interests are and what self governance is about. You know what sovereignty is about. They have that right. That's all. That's all I wanted to say. Yoko Kolo. Hesiaya, thank you so much for sharing that. And yeah, I absolutely think that it's really important to remember that we all have a role in protecting the first foods and restoring and maintaining treaty rights. And, and I hope that as people look through the climate adaptation plan, they will see something that resonates with them and the work that they're doing. Uh, to say, yes, this is how I am supporting First Foods, not only now, but into an uncertain future. And so uh, I'm so grateful to you, Antone, for being part of that development process, not only as part of the Economic and Community Development Committee, but as a language teacher as well, uh, and as a knowledge keeper, as always. Uh, and so thank you so much for continuing to be part of that process. I am so grateful for you. I think we're on a win-win, that's all. Excellent, a good place to be. Does anyone else have any thoughts about what they're excited for or what they're concerned about? And Darcy, we can go back to talking about composting if you'd like. Um, this is our opportunity to share and talk with one another. And so we can turn our cameras on. Uh, I will be bold and be the first to do that. Um, I would love to share with you um, Wenick, since I have you here and you look so beautiful today, I would love to hear your thoughts. I really like the I really like the way the document has looked. I, I've seen it when it first started and, and how Kaiden was harder to use. And it, it's such a, a nicer document for people that don't have that ability to, to really go through it and and how much you guys have worked at uh, detailing down. I know there's the other one that has more information for us that might want to take a look at as educators or um, to have something kind of on the, the back end that has more of the information, but just to kind of see how it has streamlined and come down and what amazing work that everybody has done and you have done to get there. Um, I'm really excited about the different conversations and the composting and uh, the work that uh, DRC has been doing, which is fabulous. Um, but I really like, I really look forward to just 
hearing more about the pursuit stuff and and what other people um, have to say about that as we kind of go forward. Yeah, Diane thank here. you. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you for sharing your thoughts and for being part of this process. Like, I can't say thank you enough to the play, the trust that the community has placed in our program and myself to be able to do this work. Like, this isn't new. Like, what we have done with this document really is just documenting all of the things that this tribe has already been doing and the places that the tribe and the community would like to go. And so it has been really an honor to get to vision a better future with you all and this is the next step of all of that is finding out where the rubber meets the road where should we be investing our resources and dollars to have the best benefit not only from a carbon perspective but for a quality of life and for a community uh, continuancy perspective so thank you again for everybody being part of this work Althea, I think that I might call on you now if you're available to get your sense of things. Well, as usual, thank you for being a wonderful guide through this incredibly complicated and <laughs> it's hard to not get uh, emotional about the situation we're in as gatherers and um, hunters and fishermen, people who use the land and are very aware of our use of the land is impactful. Um, so I appreciate the meaningfulness you put into the whole process and communicating to our community that their participation is what makes this document and what will come of this document more meaningful. Um, and we need everybody involved because we're, we're Umatilla and we work together. We may not work together together, but in our own individual lives, we can do one or two things. And then as employees, we can carry on what our leadership has us do and all of that, we can make a big difference for our first foods and maintain that promise as Natitite. And so I really appreciate you being our guide on this, Colleen. You've been wonderful. And I look forward to hearing the results of all of the polls you're going to be doing um, throughout the remainder of the year. And I hope everybody tells at least one or two people so we'll get more people involved in the climate implementation plan and the water settlement discussions and uh, our policy at work workshops. Me too. I'm really looking forward to getting back in the community. Like that's, that's what I do. Um, community engagement and outreach is my favorite thing. Uh, and so I'm really looking forward to getting away from the computer and coming back to talk to everybody. Um, Kate, I saw that you had your hand up. I would love to hear from you. Hi, and you can hear me okay? All right. So, yeah, I'm. Um, this is just wonderful to have a climate adaptation plan. You've done such a great job, and now we're in the implementation and outreach to folks. Um, I just wanted to add a little comment and uh, something to factor in perhaps in your outreach and that is the development of a drought early warning system and that with climate change we need to address you know, changes in our weather and address drought when it happens we're not in a drought at the moment but it's inevitable so um, there will be a conservation plan in the works as well. So that will be part of your climate adaptation plan as well for you know, a conservation plan for the community and a drought early warning system. So that's all I had to offer it was something forth, you know, coming up and to be like woven into your efforts as well. 
Thank you. Yeah. No, thank you, Kate. Um, actually, if you're willing to stay on the line, would you give us maybe a quick summary of your congratulations on your NOAA grant for the drought early warning system? Would you like to speak a little bit about it and plug uh, your upcoming workshops as well? Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm happy to uh, address what we have in store. Um, it's an interagency community uh, science collaboration, and it's to address drought and the drought early warning system. We call it a DOOS, and it'll be have a dashboard. Where we'll have all kinds of cool links and understanding of our conditions, and it it will address first foods, the impacts of drought on first foods. That's what makes our drought early warning system rather unique in the nation is um, specifics to first foods and we hope it to um, develop these indices in which we can measure the impacts to the fish and wildlife roots and berries and water and that's in development um, and then we're partnering with the ag research service um, in adams area and oregon state university and critvic and NOAA and uh, National Weather Service here in Pendleton. We have quite a few partners to help us develop this dues. And uh, let's see, uh, the meeting that we had planned this month will be canceled. Uh, we'll have an internal meeting with staff and scope our, our work plans um, as we um, discuss the, what can uh, be part of the dues. Um, and then there's a conservation plan that's independent and we'll be working with the hazard mitigation uh, plan and the CAT and uh, other plans and uh, working a conservation plan into our way of being. And uh, we'll drill two groundwater monitoring wells. We'll be expanding our spring monitoring network from Lower Umatilla Reservation uh, wide to Upper Umatilla. Springs are windows into groundwater response to drought and weather and the like. And so we'll be working in the upper watersheds as well. And I think those are the, the highlights of our, um, our drought early warning system. It's a two year grant, $430,000. and. Uh, lots of partners, and I'm really looking forward to working with everybody. So that's it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for sharing, and congratulations again on that grant. That is so huge, and that's really important to have a sense of when is drought happening for all of these different priorities. So I know that drought, like declaring a drought, is uh, something that triggers certain uh, financial support, uh, in insurance payouts and things, especially for like farmers. Um, but it's important to know where is drought affecting our first foods and our forests and our grasslands. Uh, yeah. And those are things that are not necessarily always captured with those kinds of parameters. So congratulations again with your yeah. grant and I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, so the dashboard as it relates to first foods. So we hope to have, you know, the standard weather um, Kind of indices for precipitation and soil moisture and evapotranspiration and, and the like and stream flows and groundwater levels will be new fish counts will be new and wildlife populations and uh, impacts to forest roots and berries so that that's to be determined but it, it'll be something that uh, tribal folks can log on and take a look and see you know, oh, how's this drought affecting the things I'm interested in? And we hope to present as much cultural interest in this drought early warning system. It's not specific to just the fish and wildlife and fruits and berries, cultural aspects as well as as we find out what they what we can add. So thank you. Yeah, I too am excited to see what more of the indigenous knowledge and those cultural indicators come forward through this process. Uh, I know last year I had a, a tribal member from the Colville Nation uh, contact me about um, he he has these like crazy YouTube videos where he's just breaking these trees. And, um, you know, it's very strange to watch at first, but then you kind of look at it and you think about it. And the way that he's breaking these young saplings, like they snap like twigs. 
and they really shouldn't uh, with that young of a, a tree. And so to watch him just like basically pull this tree apart uh, with his bare hands was something that was really interesting when you started thinking about it. Uh, but then talking to him, he also shared that when he was a child, he used to um, pull the needles, the conifer needles, so the pine needles, uh, and kind of thread them through on each other. Uh, and that was something that was an indigenous knowledge that he had gathered was that if they were too brittle and they broke before threading, that that was like a drought year uh, because the needles were supposed to be soft and supple and threadable. Uh, and so I'm really looking forward to more of those kinds of indicators coming forward yeah. as part of your process. Yeah, thank you. Me too. Um, yeah, we are, we have about 10 minutes left in our time. And so if you do have to go, we love, we're so grateful to have you join us. Um, we're going to keep going until the end of our time. If anybody wants to share anything, um, you know, we have kind of a small audience today. And so we are recording, but if you don't want to be picked up on the recording, just let me know that and I can make sure to um, edit uh, your contributions out, but make sure that they are still um, noted. So I would love it if um, someone else would love to share kind of some thoughts. Uh, that they have about climate adaptation in general, something that you're worried about, something that you're excited about. We're all very quiet this morning. Hopefully our in-person events. Matt, you come on camera and so now I'm going to pick on you. <laughs> Hi, Colleen. Thank you, thank you for hosting this. And yeah, I am, um, you know, really glad to be a part of this and, you know, working for the court now, one of the, the really the two branches of government of the tribe are, you know, we have a separation of powers court here. So we do have a, a an independent court. And so I'm, I'm thinking about this from a couple perspectives and, and maybe the most critical one moving forward is, um, you know, just thinking about um, uh, environmental enforcement and and making sure we have the capability to enforce some of our codes. And obviously, it's not not the court's place to, um, you know, prosecute or charge or, or investigate uh, potential violations of code as much as as well. It's it's obviously it's our place to adjudicate anything that's brought to the court. But um, you know, even thinking about kind of um, maybe more more simple, straightforward things like. You know, open burning on non-burn days, or you know, illegal dumping and, and things like that, and some of the, the the kind of more basic things we can can hopefully start to to clean up. So I just want to uh, say that I'm glad to be a part of this, and and uh, want to uh, make sure that the court is prepared for for any disputes or or issues that could be be brought before the court. Uh, also thinking about it just in terms of um, uh, resource conservation and making sure we're doing doing what we can with the the charge from the board of trustees as as well as you know with all the departments to to uh, make sure that we're doing what we can to uh, to conserve energy and and use use our resources in the most uh, uh, efficient way possible so just a couple of thoughts from from a uh, perspective of of the court and and where uh, I'm, I'm trying to, to think about uh, how we can be be a, a positive uh, part of this process going forward thank you yeah that was excellent and thank you so much for your role in developing the plan for your presentation as part of the adaptation series and for always being responsive and um, participating with us on this. I'm so grateful. Um, and you're absolutely right. That environmental enforcement is going to be uh, a component of this. Like we can set out all of these plans and these rules and these policies, but if we cannot get people to follow them, then they are only as good as the paper they're printed on, uh, which carbon sequestration, I guess, but um, we'd like them to be a little bit more, uh, have a little bit more teeth than that. Uh, and so that's really where that treatment as state, that uh, CTYR as a federally recognized tribe has a lot of uh, ability and agency, um, but that does require data. It requires modeling and monitoring uh, and so it's the not glamorous part of all of this work that going out every day and making sure that we have the information that will help us build those rules and legally defensible enforcement uh, really is the, a very important component of all of this work. Thank you for your role in all of that.
Caleb, I see your hand up. I would love to hear from you. Hey, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. I just want to um, touch on what uh, Matt was just saying. Um, enforcement is something that we're we're still kind of you know researching on how we fit into um, you know uh, the enforcement game with uh, our air quality program and our scope. It's slowly changing, and we're now kind of uh, sampling some water ourselves. And so, yeah, I have to ask myself this question um, every week. You know, how how are we, we how are we going to promulgate this to the public so that way they accept it and they implement it on their half as well. And so I just encourage all of you to um, keep asking questions and uh, DRC with the with the uh, the composting. It all starts at home, but it all starts within the community as well. And Colleen is absolutely right. We need a champion to kind of um, take that on and I will. I'll always do my best to in, encourage and support it, but um, it's it's something that all tribes are trying to um, figure out, you know, what to do with um, over over fueled reservations, and we all kind of have too many weeds, too many tumbleweeds, and a lot of leaves falling on our on our property. So I would just say keep keep at it, and there's there's no one right answer for for uh, composting, and. Uh, Kate, uh, Kate's uh, water drought, the early drought system. I, I'm, I'm excited to, to see it um, unfold. So that's just what I have for for this for sure today. That's all. Yeah, that's excellent. Thank you for sharing. Um, uh, you get the word of the day award for promulgate, promulgate, promulgate. Yeah, that was awesome. Um, and I. I appreciate you always sharing with the community that a lot of this is really a complaint based system. Unfortunately, like we don't we don't have roving patrols looking for people doing open burning like that's not a thing. Um, and so if you are experiencing um, negative impacts from something that someone is doing in your area, you have to pick up the phone and you have to let us know. And unfortunately, it's going to probably have to be repeat times that this is documented because this is how we build that that enforceable case. Uh, is through that documentation. And so I know that it's hard to, you know, feel like you're tattling on your neighbors. Um, but if it's an air quality issue, if it's a water quality issue, if it's a soil quality issue, this is actually something that helps us protect our community um, by by speaking up and saying, hey, these weren't maybe the best practices. Please, Caleb. And just remember why we're doing this work. We are doing this because uh, the plants and animals cannot speak for themselves. Excellent to remind us. Oh yeah, and potential wildfire issue too. Thank you, Matt. Um, yeah, the the weeds are a bit of a fire hazard, aren't they? So, um, with increasing carbon and with a, a longer growing period window, uh, vegetation is actually a huge problem. Um, so we can be, you know, trying to prioritize our native vegetation that is well suited for this climate and try and get a handle on some of those invasive species and those ones that are really um, creating a, a fuels hazard. We have time for um, a couple more people to share. And so if you have something that you would love to share with us, again, there's going to be multiple opportunities for us to share our thoughts, but this is just our kickoff event. And thank you for joining us. And we're looking forward to having more in the future. Again, if you want to share, now is the time. All right. Oh, I got one hand. Please go ahead, Lauren. If you're speaking, we aren't hearing you, or maybe it was an accidental press of the hand. Oh, it's not working. You'll type. OK, perfect. Yeah, um, I think we all all have different levels of our technology. Some of us have webcams. Some of us are, you know, audio is not working. Uh, so, yep. However, you're able to join us. I'm excited for more in-person ones where there isn't uh, technical difficulties. Uh, and so um, I'm really looking forward to, again, bringing back uh, information to the community and hearing what you have to say, uh, as well as getting some like coloring and art going. Let's get some like activities here with this. It's not just talking. 
Um, thank you for everyone to participate for participating. Um, I'm going to read some of the comments in the chat. Casey Radcliffe says, thank you so much for the invitation to join this leadership and thought put into this planning is so needed and well done. Looking forward to reading the document and finding ways to support this work. Thank you for being here. Um, we cannot do this alone. We are all in this together. Uh, and so we can find places where our missions overlap and where we can support the work that one another is doing. Uh, and Monica McGuire says, great job. Thank you. Thank you for um, the trust placed in me by this community. It's been really an honor to get to do this work. So Lauren, I'll read your yeah. comment out while, oh, Anton, would you like to say something? No, I just said thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, and so I think I'll yeah, probably wrap uh, it up. I, Go ahead. No, I just I didn't even know I was coming through. This is the first time I I'm speaking direct. Oh, I guess I'm on the phone. That's right. Yeah, it's the phone. Okay, I got it. I got it. Your thoughts are always Good welcome. Job. I will always silence myself for you. <laughs> Good job. Thank you. Um, so next month, we our first our second Wednesday is going to be March eighth, uh, and we're going to do a hybrid here at NGC. We haven't quite figured out what the time frame for that looks like, uh, but we know that we're going to do some art and coloring as our activity for that. Uh, and so we are going to be sending out an announcement the moment we have a date picked and a time or time picked, uh, and you can look forward to future announcements about the Umatilla Basin Water Rights Settlement, which are going to be kind of independent but connected. Uh, and then our carbon removal outreach. I'm really excited for this one because I this is something I don't even know about. Uh, and so there are opportunities to learn and money to be spent in that endeavor. Um, if you would like to be added to the email list, thank you, Georgiana Quinn. I will add you to our email list. Um, that first foods at ctuir.org is going to be a, a great place to send an email. And you can just send the subject line, add me to your, your list, or you don't even need a subject, just send us your email. Uh, and we will make sure that we'll bothering you. Um, so this is the last opportunity for anyone to share anything. Um, and uh, I would love to just want to say thank you to you again. And um, I'm looking forward to the future with you. Any like lingering thoughts, Althea? I would give you the mic to close us out maybe. Oh, I've got Lauren. So I'm going to read Lauren's comments. Uh, we can ensure we are working with groups to meet these goals that have demonstrated accountability. Uh, I read the paper for the carbon sequestration demonstration and saw that they could not produce any data about the system holding pressure. This was a result of the tracer compound being spilled on the soil. I think this has the potential to benefit our tribes, and I hope we will learn more about it as we go forward. Thank you, Lauren. Um, so what you are referencing is the Wallula project that uh, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory uh, conducted. The project initially went forward in 2013, uh, and they're just now a decade later collecting data about what's going on in the injection well. So they took a thousand tons of CO2, carbon dioxide, and they basically like pressurized it until it was liquid and they injected it down into a little borehole uh, in the Columbia River basalts back in 2013. So we're still really learning about this project because there hasn't been a lot of information forthcoming about it. And what Lauren was talking about uh, was that there is a tracer that they have injected as part of this. They don't quite know the science of what's going on. And so I'm hoping that they will participate with us on one of these future carbon removal uh, outreach opportunities so that we can learn more and understand what they have already done and their plans for the future. So thank you for that addition, Lauren. Althea, would you like to have the last words, please. She might have stepped away. And so with that, I think that I will just uh, come bring us to a close uh, again, unless anyone has any lingering thoughts. Um, and we're going to do this again next month, but also in kind of uh, un unpredictable iteration. So look for those announcements again, and we'll make sure to get those out as early as possible so that we can get those on your calendar. Um, I am really grateful again to everyone who was part of the development of this document. It was a labor of love over many years with many, many people involved. Uh, and I'm so grateful for the knowledge that was shared in its development. Thank you so much, everyone. I see someone is typing, and so I am going to kind of let this run for the next few minutes. 
but you are all welcome to proceed with the rest of your day. And I'm so grateful for you having joined us here today. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. I appreciate your outreach as well. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your week and I look forward to talking with you soon. All right, I'm gonna close this out. Thanks, talk to you soon, everybody.